I'm glad you're here. We are here with We Can Listen. We're back, better than ever before. And as, as at We Can Listen, I just want to tell you a little bit about what this is all about. Why are we here? What makes it such a special place? First of all, the old church, the old historic church, TOC, is a very special place where the community gets to come together and they get to see one another. And when I say see each other, I mean really get to hear about our lives, see one another, invest in each other, feel like we are all part of a community that is cohesive and connected. And so that's why we're here. And uh, we, we can listen, they give me a little something to say about it, but I want you to understand that it goes way So. We strive to build community, educate, and share the positive impact that truly listening to diverse voices can have on us all. So that idea of really hearing one another, beyond just assuming what you think you know about people. If you look at me, you don't know that I'm Mexican, that I'm Creole, that I'm Black, and that I have all kinds of Artist, artistic uh, beliefs and understandings that are not cohesive with what you think you see, right? So we have to quit making assumptions about folks and really get to the point of hearing one another and listening and understanding what the other person is trying to say. Uh, through a cultural intersection of storytelling, film, music, poetry, dance, and personal expression, we support individuals and grassroots organizations as they raise their voices on compelling social justice issues. Portlanders have demonstrated these issues as being very important. We hope these personal stories will reach audiences that haven't reached before and provide the opportunity for all who hear them to increase their understanding of issues that require action and awareness in our greater community. So We Can Listen has been um, really at the forefront, I think, of giving folks the opportunity to do intergenerational gathering. So you can really, really hear what's happening across the spectrum and find out where your place is in it. So tonight we have something really fabulous to hear uh, about. And um, I had a lot of fun back in the back talking to um, our guest speakers that are here tonight and having them express their passion. So I'm not going to offset that in any way by saying something that may not be a part of what they want to express. But I will give you some instructions that you can follow so you know what to do after you hear them. Um, what I want you to do is just... Uh, Know that there is a tasting and intermish at intermission, which is what we all want, is a good tasting of good food, uh, and that it's really important for you all to return into the second half, come back to the second half, and then be seated so that um, when, since we're doing filming and television, and we've got the crew right back there, can you put your hands together for our crew? It's cool. <laughs> So just go in and do your tasting and everything and then come back and we'll get ready for the second half, okay? But uh, for now, I'm just going to bring them up one at a time and they're going to do their thing for about 10 minutes. And you can really listen because we can. Guest speaker, our first speaker is Mia. And I won't say the last two names because I just want you to know her as Mia. She's a dancer, an agriculturalist, and she's with Bolt. Okay. Oh, hello. Check, a check, check. Come on, come up and give your 10 minutes right here. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Mia. Um, I... We'll just share like some of the basic things of my journey getting into land work and agricultural um, 
life. Um, I was born and raised here in Portland, Oregon. I spent most of my life dancing and doing creative work, um, dance, music, film, all, all things creative. Um, and that was kind of my niche. And my awakening to land work was this kind of disgust almost of being, um, <laughs> like my association with working with the land was was being a slave. So I didn't want to, I didn't want anything to do with that. So I had this um, just deep sense of not knowing where my food came from. And as I later in life started to realize that I needed to know where it came from and that it was actually really deep and ancestral connection to be in relationship with the land, um, was when things shifted for me. Um, and so I started to grow like small things, like herbs, things that I didn't, well, a lot of things died actually. But I planted <laughs> in my first raised bed, <clears throat> I think I planted and in pots, kale, pot pumpkins, beans, and I think one other thing by seed. And I was like really ambitious, like I'm gonna just grow this stuff because I'm connected to the earth now. And everything died except for the kale, which <laughs> I didn't have to do anything for, you know? Like it rains so much here. And I went on a trip and came back in the winter and it was still alive. And I was like, wow, kale, so magical. Um, and that kind of like sparked so much interest in what I was doing with plants because I was like, oh, I don't want them all to die. So how do I, how do I shift things around? And then I later learned that I was planting even on the wrong side because I was tracking the sun in August at its highest. You know, so I had to shift my bed, grow things from starts, um, and then I saw I just saw a lot of growth. And then my understanding for life really grew um, out of that as well, just the relationship to life and death, to um, what I'm eating, how what I grew actually tastes so much better than anything I've ever bought. Um, and then I, I think it was when I, when I became pregnant was, which was two years ago, um, was really the spark and the fire to be like, oh shit, what am I doing? <laughs> like, yeah, this is cute, I can grow some vegetables, but I'm gonna really need to figure out how to um, shift my life because I grew up um, what, how I would say is low income. And so I really needed to shift that around for myself. Um, and so with a couple sisters, Alexandria, who has two babies, Shantae Johnson, um, who has six babies, Kittist, Olivia, Anaka, and myself, we came together to kind of, I feel like the purpose was to revision and, and recreate a foundation for the future that we wanted to see in our lives and our community. And, um, Originally, I, for myself, it was like, we wanna do natural building. I wanna build my own home. Um, and then it was like, oh, where am I gonna build my home? Because I don't own any land. And I'm like, where am I gonna get land from? I don't have any money, I don't have any credit. Nobody in my family has credit. Like, so it was like this, oh, that's not gonna happen. And I even had friends who owned land, um, white friends who owned over 50 acres and I, we would present this natural building project to them. And he was like, yeah, that sounds cool, but you could just do your own thing. Like this community you're trying to build isn't my community. And we we're all black women, mothers, um, and that was, the, that was the community we were trying to nurture. So that individual kind of being like, mm, I don't know, um, also sparked this um, in, inspiration and energy into, okay, we need to buy the land. Um, Shantae, who is also 
a part of this collective, um, has been farming for many years, and she is currently leasing to own the land. So she has like a five-year operation, her and Arthur, um, that is on land that could be taken away. And they feed hundreds of families for free. So this idea of how historically farmers do so much work for the community, but the land isn't actually owned by them was um, an another just like sparks. We have like these several sparks of like, we need, we need to do this thing. And I feel like it was this really divine timing and um, a perfect alignment of individuals and what we wanted to see in the world. Um, and, and we all just kind of went with that energy. So we saw what we wanted to see. We came together regularly to kind of vision and plan and think about all the possibilities um, and really dream. Like we were, like we're sisters dreaming together what we need. Um, and so this year, our second year, um, we as a nonprofit organization, Land Trust, the Black Oregon Land Trust, bought our first 10 acres of land in Corbett, Oregon and my family has moved on to that land. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's exactly what we've been dreaming of. So it just, it feels really amazing to be um, on stage with such leaders in our community who are like, like food, to me, <laughs> food is everything. You need to eat to live, you need to know, you need to understand creation too, which what better teacher than the earth and you know. Um, yeah, so I'm a beginner. I feel like I represent the possibilities and the future of um, like young black agricultural, agriculturalists who um, are aspiring to be farmers and land workers and land stewards. Um, and on the land that I will be stewarding, that I am stewarding, um, we will be doing a lot of education to really spark that inspiration in new farmers because there's not, from our understanding, there's not as many um, young, like the number of people we need to step into the roles is lower and slower than the amount of people who are like phasing out of the work. And it is so much work and it takes so much energy and um, the, the ways that we can inspire people um, in this land is gonna be really exciting. And yeah, I think that's it. That was such a peaceful like two minutes. <laughs> I was like, oh God, okay. Um, but yes, thank you so much. try and do the same thing. So it's, it's, the humility in you is beautiful and the ownership of who you are and what you've expressed to us is even more. So thank you, thank you for sharing a little bit with us, okay? We're gonna come back to you during the, during the panel portion, but next we're gonna speak with uh, Theron Mayu. And uh, that's my buddy out there. I loved coming up and seeing uh, the food that he had created and the, the, the way that we could all come together and kind of experience that. So this is a chef and the owner of Right 
Yes, me too. The owner of Right Bayou Cajun Cuisine. Thank you. My name is Theron Mayu. I was born and raised in New Orleans. I've been here in Oregon for 19 years. And I, when I moved here, I, was, I stayed in Corvallis for one year and worked at a vegan restaurant. That was really fun. And it was a small family. And I felt like I was part of it. And living there in Corvallis, I really had appreciation for like the farm to restaurant and how close the community worked together. And it gave me appreciation for good food and, and, and how important farmers were. And my friend David here, who got me here and invited me here, he's a farmer and he's one of my friends who I really look up to. And for this, my culinary career, I think that just chose me because um, my, my dad was a f chef in New Orleans. I went to culinary school there. And during my time in culinary, I came visit for one week. And then I wind up moving here because I had a baby on the way. <laughs> and so now, um, yes, I have a four, four kids, three daughters and one son. And from there, um, I got a job. When I left, I moved from Corvallis to here in Portland, I landed a job at Jake's Famous Crawfish. And it's a landmark, and I worked there for 10 years. And while working there, I would um, always go to the food carts and get food from the different food carts on my break. And a lot of my coworkers would laugh, like, why are you eating food cart food when you can eat food here? You not scared? I'm like, no, it's good. I'm like, I would just support the food carts, and it was something that inspired me to where I felt like, you know what, one day I want to have a food cart. You know, this doesn't look like, you know, it looked like it's possible, you know? And so from there, um, I, left New, um, I left Jake's, and I started working at New Seasons. And when I went to New Seasons, I um, got a job in produce. And so that was another time where I was meeting farmers and building these relationships with the farmers and just people from the community. And at that time, the stars aligned for me to get a cart. <laughs> and um, yeah, it all happened so fast, but I had a guy who was selling the cart and he didn't really want to sell it. And he had tons of people lined up to buy the cart. And out of everyone, he chose me. And, and it was like, yeah, it was a dream come true. And from there, <laughs> yes. And from there, I've just been in business for um, the last seven years, doing more like um, festivals, because um, I live out in Clackamas County. And so I have a mobile food cart, so I'm not in one spot. And, um, and with my name, um, I got a little you know, wordplay with the right by you. But I always tell people, wherever you at, I can be right by you. And so it's like, that was a good part for me when I, I like um, being mobile and, and that part to where I can just go out to wherever the people are. And um, yeah, what else I can say? Like a lot of my inspiration came from my, it's from my dad. You know, my dad, he was like the person in my life that really made me realize like, we all have to eat, you know, and how important cooking was, you know, and he would always try to show me and my brother, you know, all kind of things, but my brother would never um, pay attention because he would be like, um, I'm going to get a woman to cook for me. <laughs> and my dad would be like, well, you're going to starve, son. He's like, you know, you want to depend on no one when it comes to, like, you know, things like that. Food, we all need to know how to cook. And, and from a little kid, um, I just always was in the kitchen. And on my mother's side, I have to mention that, my grandfather, he was a baker. And so from on that side of the family, I would, when I was with my grandmother and my grandfather, I would do um, wedding receptions and all these things as a little kid. And then when I was with my dad, it was always like more outdoor things like going hunting and fishing, more fishing than hunting, but I would do hunting with my grandfather, who I just mentioned. But um, I got to experience all those things at a young age, and especially with, um, with baking and things like that. And so from a young age, people would, um, all the elders would just, they'd be like, I know you, you're um, cake man grandson, or you're um, the chef's son, you know? And I'll be like, you know, it would always be amazed me how people knew me from my family through food. And so it's like, I think food chose me and it's important for the community. And Portland on the whole just made me feel welcome. And yeah. Um, I don't know
much. Well, say yeah. I don't thank y'all for coming out. Bring the mic over, Mr. Casey. Oh, yeah. The mic's Okay, yes. Bring it to Mr. Casey. All right. Well, I'm going to introduce somebody whose name has been a part of this community for years and years and years. And it's always a name that's connected with respect and with trust. And so I'm, I'm very happy to become reacquainted with uh, Theodos Kaysen. Uh, he's a butcher and an owner of Kaysen's Fine Meats. Thank you, thank you. I'm not playing the uh, race card, I'm playing the H card tonight. Bad knees and bad hips after a lot of standing, a hard day today. But i have native son of Portland, Oregon. Of, uh, I'm number nine of 10 kids. All of my brothers and sisters before me had a different trait. And I knew somewhere down the line that I wanted to be a meat man. So I used to go down to the old Safeway store and watch the meat cutters work. Not realizing being on the other side of the glass how cold and treacherous it was from looking on the other side of the glass. But I thank God for the experience, and I've been doing it all my life, basically, and I love what I do. I like to make people happy. Meat makes the meal if you're a meat eater, you know? <laughs> and that's what it's all about, is giving a, a good piece of meat, a good service, and that's all I want to do when I've Worked at Fred Meyer stores, Safeway stores, and I have my own now because it's important to me because you're putting something in your body and you want to know what you're putting in it. And I'm reaching out to the best places around the state, the country, that's what is a good piece of meat, what is a good chicken that you can have. And I learned I, we can do some local stuff around the state of here in the state of Oregon. And we want to be better, and we want to feed our people better. Because, hey, we want to have long life in, in what we're putting inside of us. You know, it's, it's very important to uh, understand that. You know, people don't know it's uh, different grades and different choices of meat. They come in, and a lot of people shop for the dollar. Well, that's not a good piece of meat, and a lot of people don't understand, well, you, uh, you get a chuck steak, and that's not, a, that's not a grilling steak. So I try to educate along the way and, and uh, give everybody a good experience and make friends along the way so we can be better as people. And this initiative tonight is going to make us better because we're listening, we're hearing, and we got to grow. And we've got to understand, hey, we are one. And we only here for a little while passing through. And we want to do the best we can while we're here. We want to eat great stuff, great food for the bodies, because what you put in is what makes your body. And it's, it's very important. So I'm going to say this here. I'm going to put a promo in there. Christmas is coming, and uh, a lot of people eat prime ribs. And if you haven't got yours, come by Case and Fine Meat. <laughs> at 50, 15 Northeast Alberta and MLK, we have a great selection and we give a good service and uh, we love what we do. The place is clean, that's my number one pee pet because I've been all over and uh, we, want it, we want it right. You know, we want it right for everybody. I don't want nobody to have a bad experience on nothing we do and we just want to grow this thing bigger and bigger and hopefully we'll have some farmers around here that has good beef where we're being able to produce right here and give it to the people at a cheaper price. Because right now the market is messed up. There's four, uh, four companies controlling the whole market. And a lot of stuff, there's shortage of supplies and a lot of stuff we don't see and we don't know. But it's just not just a piece of meat, you know, so. I just thank everybody for showing up and listening. 
I don't have a whole lot right now, but I'm giving you what I got, and uh, it's going to get better. So thank you, and come on by and see us at Kaysen's. Our next, I can use my voice. How's that? Our next uh, person up is somebody that we connected with over, um, reconnected with over the pandemic when we were doing a, another film called Tipping Point. And uh, Rochelle Dixon is her name. She's a small business owner, she's a chef, and a farmer. And so she's going to talk to you a little bit about what that means in her life. Thank you. This is going to make me feel, make me feel short. Not that I'm that tall, but uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great, great. Thank you so much for showing up tonight. I'm so excited to be here with all of you folks. Let's give them a hand. Woo! Well, I don't know where to begin, but I'll tell you something. I could be here for 45 hours, so somebody's going to tip me off when we get to eight minutes, right? Okay, because I want to talk about goats food justice, I want to talk about it all. But let's just start with, with, with the basics. So I was born in Seattle, Washington, the youngest of, of seven children. I was actually born in Chinatown. Some people think that's a punchline, but it's actually true. Because of segregation, um, we could only live in certain places. And so my father decided that Chinatown was um, a pretty good place. And so we lived in Ch uh, Chinatown, and I grew up there. But I'm actually the first generation off, off the farm and the second generation off the reservation. So creating food and creating, having natural foods is just literally in my blood. And I did that as a child. So if you, if you were the child that made the mud pies and, and put the little dandelions on it and all of that, maybe, maybe you understand what my childhood was like. I was always playing in the dirt all the time. But I didn't really want to play in the dirt as a profession. What I wanted to do is I wanted to help people be healthier. And I thought I would get into medicine. So I did. When I grew up, I was in medicine. I was a clinical research associate for 14 years, and I worked in endocrinology on bone mineral metabolism disease, uh, disorders. And I say that because when you think of a farmer, what kind of a background do you think a farmer has? You know, People are like, what? so you, you plant things. Well, yeah, I plant things. I do a lot of other things, too. But my first profession was actually in medicine. So I started out in medicine when I was actually 17 as a CNA, worked my way through, bought a house when I was 21, because you can do that with the wages they used to pay. <laughs> with the wages they used to pay, I wanted to buy my house at 20, but I had to wait until I could sign the contract. I couldn't even join the, uh, the uh, in, in retirement program when I started to work at Providence. But after five years, they gave me a little pin, and I got off and went off and got married. Woo-hoo! You know, <laughs> it's going to be so wonderful, you know. <laughs> well... It, there were parts that were really wonderful. And, and I married someone like myself that had the, the same religious background, that, but was an immigrant from another country. And we both enjoyed food. And we owned two restaurants together. So we did that. And after the divorce, because you knew that was coming, right? So <laughs> after the divorce, I let him have the restaurant. And, and I moved back here, where my family is from. And I started working again with, with, with food in, in the land. And I wanted to always preserve my memory, some of it which I think, I, I think is very ancient, um, that my mother handed down to me, and that sometimes I know things and I don't know how I know them. And um, I think there's just ancestral knowledge in, in just doing certain things. So I returned to working with the land. I had a third of an acre, which I used for a test garden, and I taught classes for free on how to grow your own vegetables in small place because I was coming from a food justice perspective and I was noticing that people had food, if you could consider top ramen food, if you could consider bar -S hot dog food. I mean, these things are like 88 cents a pack and the number one ingredient is, is meat byproducts, which is the stuff that falls off the you know, conveyor belt when they're doing actual cuts of meat. 
and um, then a lot of corn products, which doesn't make you very healthy at all, right? So there's not amount of, a lot of nutrients in the food that people are eating. And unfortunately, a lot of people of color are eating these foods because they're cheaper. And uh, there are, even in this area, there are food deserts. And so a food desert is living approximately, there are different, different descriptions of it, but about a mile and a half from something you would consider fresh. So if you live near a 7-Eleven and you shop there for food, if you live near a dollar store and you shop there for food, but you're probably in a food desert. But it's not just about where you live, it's about what's financially accessible to you, how far did it come to get to your plate, so there's climate change, all of that. But for me, I wanted to get back to my roots and I noticed something, that the health of the community was really suffering behind poor food choices that we have. I can go into a store now and miss 90% of the store because 90% of the store is nothing I should be eating. I still do eat some of it sometimes though, okay? I eat some of it, okay? Because every once in a while, corn chip is just really good. But things that come in boxes, things that are shipped, the amount of energy it takes to put something on a plane, a boat, and ship it to get to your store, and you don't really need to eat it, and it's kind of nutrient poor by the time you got there. So I th started working on food justice. Then I did, ran into this big problem that Mia talked about earlier, and that's land ran into land justice problems. So in 2018, I decided I was gonna fix it. And I ran for, uh, does anybody know what I ran for? Anybody here remember the bitter battle, battle of the blank ballot? So I, I ran for a position that you're probably not uh, familiar with, soil and water conservation. And I accidentally wrote down my address as Northeast instead of Southeast. Now, the reason I did that is I lived in Southeast, but I, I bought my house in Northeast and I was raised in Concordia District all my life. So I made a little error and man, I got into it with the food and agriculture system because they didn't want to elect me to talk about land use because I didn't own or manage 20 acres. That's the requirement. Who owns or manages 20 acres in Portland? There's only one group that does. Does anybody know who, who that is? Yeah, white folks, yeah, that's true too, that's true. But it's the city, no one else does. So this is an entirely crazy rule for an urban area. So I decided to rewrite the law and um, I rewrote it. And after I rewrote it and I thought it was good, I got calls from smaller communities in Astoria. I got a call from Mother Jones and they said, yeah, it's good. But here's the problem. We live in smaller communities and it doesn't work for us either. So I, I scrapped it, the law I wrote, <laughs> so I could make it better. But I've been still working on land justice internationally, uh, not internationally, but um, nationally rather, with the American Sustainable Business Council which is a Washington DC organization that works with um, businesses like Ben and & Jerry's and all that. Because without land justice, we can't have food justice, right? We can, without land justice, without food justice, we can't have climate justice. If the only thing that people can eat comes from a pig farm that pollutes and that's what they can afford, who are you to tell them not to eat it? By the way, I'm vegan. I won't eat it. I won't serve it, but if that's what people have to eat, that's what they're gonna eat. So how are you gonna deal with the fact that this pig farm is polluting the water, right? So you have to deal with, with traditional farming, and you also have to look at some new ways of farming. Climate change is coming fast. It's already here. So my farm experience, to, to sum it up, has just been a wild thing. So I went from farming in Canby in 2020, which was really nice. I almost died on a tractor, driving into a duck pond that I couldn't see because it was so, the land needed to be cleared and the, 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 the grass was up to here. But I, I, I didn't, I got off the um, tractor. I had to call someone, I, was, I got my cell phone, I'm like, you know what? I'm on the back of a tractor here and I can't get off. <laughs> I need you to come out here from Gresham and get me off this, this tractor. And I wanna give a shout out to the uh, commissioner of 
Gresham, Mario Palmero, who actually came and got me off the back of the tractor because the other person on the farm was an 83-year-old male. And I had fears about him even trying to help me get off the tractor and how both of us might go down. But anyway, so I got my goats and everything is going well and I'm farming and it's community and it's wonderful. But guess who doesn't own the land? This chick doesn't own squat. So I can't make a five-year plan or anything like that. All I can do is day after day after day. And then there are issues with the land, like the trees that I think are going to come down. So I kind of deal with those things. And as I'm dealing with those things, I'm learning from the farmer about his farming experience. And as I'm listening to it, I'm understanding this is not going to work for me. The way that he farms is just a micro version of industrial farming, which is not what I do at all. And so there's a lot of hand tools in what I do. Not that I don't use a tractor. So right after the tree fell that I was absolutely expecting to fall, um, but it, it came this far from the yurt, so I didn't die. Then the fires came, and then there was a flood. So I moved out of the yurt, and I moved into an urban area, back to urban farming. Well, I had to move the goats, and my friends took the goats, and they moved around, and eventually I brought them out to an urban farm. That was not a great situation, um, because every time I left, some of the kids were trying to ride the goats Somebody was smoking cannabis with the goats. Um, goats are great ambassadors, though. My neighbors loved me, and they loved the goats. But to really be effective, I needed land. And I put down a bid on some land and found out that the person did not have enough invested to actually sell me the acreage. So when you own 100 acres, you might be able to sell 20. If the bank allows you to, it depends. So that got undone. I was so excited. And then I decided to try again with land in, in, in Springfield, you know, where, uh, what's the name of that show? Springfield with Matt Groening. What do we call that? The Simpsons. The Simpsons. Yeah. Did you guys know the Simpsons came from Springfield, Oregon? Yeah. So that, that Springfield. And in between, I had a couple of experiences with farming in the urban area. And I had to pare down because in Canby, I had grapevines that were established. They weren't mine, but they were established, and I was able to use them. There was a fruit orchard. I had goats. I had everything going. It was just so perfect. But I did have to leave. And when I left, there were very few things that I had space to be able to do as a market farmer. So I decided to just hone in on a few things. And so with being a restaurant owner and a chef, I decided that those few things would be things that I could reproduce for other restaurant owners and they could buy locally and organic. And so I settled on mushrooms and flowers. And you might be thinking, mushrooms? Because I'm vegan and I can do wonderful things with mushrooms. Everybody loves mushrooms, right? Most people do. And I found out they had a lot of health benefits um, to them. So I started doing mushrooms and today I even brought one of my products that I make, which is a mushroom chocolate. You're like, mm, mushroom and chocolate? But it's, it's great because if you haven't had a good mushroom um, and chocolate, you're going to be really surprised that it's like the bitterness of chocolate. It has a little hints of bitterness. But without land, we won't have climate justice. Without land, we won't have food justice. And every one of you in here, whether black or brown or whatever you are, is at risk for not having a food supply. Look at what's happening to Ukraine. The average age of a farmer is 58. People are retiring. We need to get land into somebody else's hands besides Bill Gates. He's up to no good. Okay, he's up to no good. Just, he is the largest single owner of land right now. And he bought farms to do specifically GMO farming that he'll be leasing out to people. That sounds like sharecropping to me. So I want to encourage you whenever you can to buy directly from farmers that are local so that we can have a local food supply and that that local food supply can be security for the United States so that we're not depending on other countries for where our food from, comes from. Now, I think I probably spent 20 minutes up here talking, so I'm gonna let y'all go. We'll have to talk about the goats and the cannabis another time at Lentz, or come see me and come get some chocolate. <laughs> Good job. Good job. 
Well, the good news is that uh, you guys will have a chance to interface and talk to the panel also after our last speaker. But we would like to have, uh, David, I'm going to have you come on up here with me. Yeah. Now, see this, you see this beautiful face? This is the face that will greet you when you come out to, where, where am I going? We're going to go out to uh, Theron's food cart. Yes. And we're going to have some turkey gumbo. And the gumbo is based from my farm, where we. Uh, Where's your farm and what is your We're farm? in Benton County. And on a good note for Sister Rachel Dixon, I did get elected to the Soil and Water Conservation District, you know? The first. Wait a minute, I didn't hear that again. The first. Yeah. I, I won't uh, hold you too long because we're going to go out to uh, get the gumbo and we'll be able to have more conversation. But like Theron, uh, my dad played a big part. Uh, we grew up hunting in the woods in Arkansas and we ate everything. Um, we hunted squirrels, bobcats, deer wild pigs, um, so that's my background with my dad. We had a garden in our backyard uh, where we grew our own food. We also uh, had lived on uh, urban, uh, what they call urban interfaced area where there was still homes being built where there was farms. So we grew up with Mr. Millsap uh, as a young boy uh, growing strawberry patches and potato patches. So. That's a little bit of my background uh, from a young age. And then older, how I got into uh, agriculture. Um, my great granddad had chickens and rabbits and I used to get the chicken eggs that we would make with grits in the morning. Um, so that led me to owning the farm where I am now in uh, Benton County. It's called Cross Eye Cricket Farms. Um, and the reason we're here is I want everyone here to listen to our stories about the black food system. Um, Sister Mia and I have recently met and um, her organization Bolt is doing great things, inspirational. Um, I moved uh, approximately eight years ago uh, to a farm. Um, I spent the last 18 years I uh, put my life on the line to get property, to get land. I have four sons, and they're learning farming, they're learning agriculture, and we are woven into our community. It's a small community, approximately 80 people, uh, very tight-knit, and I learn a lot. Um, yeah, sorry. And then uh, Theron and I have, he's invited me to events like this, for over the last four, four years, so I'm just happy to repay him. Uh, he's an inspirational human, a great father, um, a great friend. I love him and respect him. Uh, speaking of a little boy, when I was a little boy, my father used to take us to Mr. Kaysen's previous location and shop, and we used to shop meat and buy from Mr. Kaysen. So I've been doing this. I grew up in East, East Portland, uh, real quick in my backyard, I used to have a beautiful garden, the talk of the neighborhood, and we started raising meat chickens and egg layers. So I was steeped in the game before I really got in the game, if you feel me. Uh, so Mr. Kaysen uh, and I have established, reestablished uh, our relationship. I grow uh, grass-fed, pasture-raised chickens. And you can get them when you go get the prime rib and whatever you're going to get at his butcher. Get the chicken. Get the chicken. And um, years ago, when I was shaking the tree, um, trying to be heard. Thank you guys for coming. I was trying to be heard for a long time. This sister um, reached out, and we're here today because of her. Um, thank you. Um, and Amanda and Old Church, everyone here, thank you guys. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation um, after we go get some farm fresh turkey gumbo. Okay. So 
we want to be sure that you all um, take the time, enjoy the food, enjoy conversation, ask questions of our panelists, or just eat. Just eat a lot. <laughs> and then we're going to come back and we're going to have some questions that we'll have them field and be able to talk and answer about um, what they do and how they do it collectively. Yes. Yes, I can. I'm not that important. I'm just here to facilitate. But my name is Julianne Johnson Weiss, and I'm an entertainer and performer and writer and teacher and all that stuff. But you know what's more important? My grandfather had a garden where he fed the neighborhood in the Borthwick, Shaver, Mississippi area. And he was a farmer in Texas. You see there's a thread of us being modeled. It was all modeled for us. And that's what makes you feel the importance. So I'm against ageism completely because we all need to hear each other's stories. And that's going to help us move forward. So hang in there. Let's go get something to eat, and we'll come right back. <laughs>
That's good. Needs, I know, a little satiated. Yes, yes. Well, we have one other person, don't we? Am I missing? David. Oh, David. <laughs> I don't know where he is. We'll take, a, take about a minute, okay? I uh, know, there you go. I agree with that. Meat makes the meal. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That is so funny. Hey. Hey, sorry. That's all right. We're food outside. Mm -hmm. I think you took the last gumbo, didn't you? You no, took the last little bit. Yet. Oh, yep. He hasn't had any yet. Not yet. How do you do Not that? Not yet. Uh, I don't know how I did that, but I... How did you do that? Well, we're back. We're back. And um, can we just give an applause for all these beautiful people that showed up for us today to share their stories? So I'm going to kick it off with a question that we received. And it says, if I can read, hold on, hold on. What is your farming agriculture background? Try to say Two, three sentences. Go. Childhood, adulthood, my family. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Very similar. My mom was raised on a farm, and we farmed small scale in northeast Portland and Concordia District. So mom showed me how to do it. Well, myself. Uh, okay. Yeah, bring that, bring that mic up. Myself, uh, my granddad was a hog farmer in Mississippi. And my dad raised, uh, excuse me, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. You get that right. My dad raised cattle here on Skyline Boulevard when he came to Portland. What? So, yeah. Cattle on Skyline. Did you know? Yeah, so. <laughs> was, oh, yeah. Wow. That's so, so great. A lot of history. And then my life is uh, every Fred Meyer store except two in the city of Portland, every Fred Meyer store in the uh, Vancouver, Washington, from Longview on down. Mm. So I put a lot of work in the trenches to learn and to get where I'm at and yeah. to yeah. go farther. To go farther. To go farther. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what's the question? What's farming? Uh, oh, I'm coming back. What is your farming agricultural background? Well, I can say my grandfather on my mo mother's side, I forgot to talk about this earlier. He grew sugar cane in the backyard. And so he was a baker. And as a kid, he would um, cook at home too, bake at home. And so all my friends, we would eat cake trimmings, but we would call them cake scraps. Mm -hmm. And with the sugar cane, and, oh, it was so good. <laughs> I miss eating just straight raw sugar cane, straight from the garden. So that was something that was very special in my childhood. Wow, you may yeah. see. I had forgotten because I had sugar cane when I was little. Yeah. I used to chew on it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, teething babies, sugar cane. <laughs> uh, my background is mostly like self-learn, trial and error, um, and then I spent two years with Mudbone Grown Farms um, doing volunteer coordination, mm -hmm. kind of learning um, throughout the days of the summer season. Mm -hmm. And as a child, did you also garden? Did you do that sort of thing? Or did you even think about it? No. See? I wanted to be a dancer. I love that. <laughs> I love that. So the foods that you eat as a dancer, watch me connect the dots here. <laughs> what kind of diet did you have as a dancer? And where did you study dance? As a kid, I, I ate a lot of junk. Mm -hmm. We would like drive through the fast food restaurants on the mm -hmm. way home. So I ate a lot of McDonald's. And I went to like, I don't know, I just was able to eat that food and not 
um, change my figure, but as I started being like, oh, I need to kind of like be healthy, I need to be, try to be more skinny, because I did a lot of ballet, um, I, I just ate a lot of junk, actually. See, so that's what I wanted you to know. <laughs> I knew that I needed to like eat healthy, but I was not. That is okay, yeah. that is okay, because how many people really enjoy a good Dorito? <laughs> All right, you know what? It's good to know where you are and then where you're trying to go, <laughs> right? All right, and um, let me see here. Here's another question for you. Do you have a background in anyone else? Because I know you have a background in livestock, right? Right. Do any of you have a background in livestock at all? I'm just getting started with that. Goats, well, there's goats. I have to say yes to the goats, but because I'm vegan, I did not necessarily farm the goats. I mm -hmm. farmed with the goats, okay. as the goats were there to actually do a job mm -hmm. and to eat the blackberry brush. Right. And so when you're sleeping, they're, well, they're sleeping too, actually. <laughs> um, goats go to bed early. They put themselves to bed early. Is it true um, that they faint? Do they really faint? Well, not, I didn't have fainting goats. I had dwarf Nigerian goats and, and um, so what they do is they help you to extend your reach on the mm -hmm. farm. Mm -hmm. Instead of hiring labor and mm -hmm. using gasoline to cut things down, mm -hmm. you can just go through the very natural process of having them eat the leaves, the leaves, or collect the sunlight for the blackberry mm -hmm. bush. They're not able to survive without the light, so the, um, the goats keep them down. And that's why I had, had the goats. And plus, they're just really cute. We they did goat cute. yoga, too. It was fun. Yeah, they're cute. Yeah. Go, go, they really fun. are. Yeah, I have uh, cattle, sheep, Ooh. goats, and fowl. How do we find you, your farm? Uh, you can find me on the internet. Uh, out on the table over here, uh, there's some flyers that mm -hmm. we have. And some of you guys ate the pumpkin loaves that oh. Melissa made. So good. Um, so good. From the farm. So good. And there's uh, not very many honeys left, but there is some um, farm fresh honey also out there um, on the table across from Rachel's. That's awesome. I love I loved the um, pumpkin bread. That was so good. Yeah. Yeah, it she's really, really good. Really tasty. What has been your experience with local and national government and non governmental organizations? I know, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'll go again. So yeah. that was yeah. non-governmental and governmental organizations, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? You could pick one if you'd like. Um, I've had some really good experiences in the last few years with non-governmental mm -hmm. organizations that mm -hmm. um, I'd like to shout out. Mm -hmm. uh, the Black Food Fund. Mm -hmm. They uh, bought my cattle. I can't thank them enough. Nice, um, nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, my kids, we went and loaded them up in Sandy and brought them to our farm, and it was a great experience. We got mm -hmm. videos and pictures to prove it. Um, also, uh, friends of Family Farm uh, out of uh, Junction City. Um, these two organizations, non-government, have changed my life in the mm. direction that um, mm. is a complete 180 from where, where we were. And then uh, governmental organizations, again, uh, Benton Soil and Water Conservation District. Mm -hmm. I've been an associate director for the previous two years, good, right? but this last November I was elected. And uh, yeah, Rachel and I were talking about this. She doesn't remember, but um, yeah, she's... Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's a, a, a good experience, and um, so now I've started working with uh, governmental agencies mm -hmm. in official and unofficial capacity, mm -hmm. so that, that's just a little bit. But. You know, it's always so good to have um, a platform to come from so that you can actually affect some change. You have to have... Um, that's why it's good to partner, to see all of you here and to see you come from all different walks of life. That's really important because 
your circle of influence may not be mine, but there are people who listen to you, respect what you think, and they would actually join in with someone like the people on the panel in order to assist with this kind of venture of, of becoming self-sufficient, you know, and not relying so heavily on outside influences. So it's really great to see you all here, but I, my wish is that um, we can fill this space and it's a sea of people that live here in the Portland area. There's a lot to be done and you can't do it by yourself and we can't do it on an island, okay? We have to have, have uh, the connectivity that we need in order to, for the, our voices to be lifted. Now we can lift our voice, don't worry about that. We know what we're saying and we can say it. But if I'm saying it and you're standing next to me and nodding, then everybody that knows you is going, wait a minute, what are they talking about? And then they lean in. And that's the key is we gotta get folks leaning in and hearing and listening and then activating so that we can make change. That's what I'm trying. That's Julianne's platform, not gonna keep it. <laughs> How about this? This is a great, um, great question. What has been a recent success? Recent success. Yeah. 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 Um, purchasing as a land trust, a collective of black women and mothers, um, purchasing our first piece of land and my family moving on to that land to steward it. That's been uh, <laughs> yeah. the best And it thing. opened up yeah. everything. That's beautiful. That's good. Recent success. A recent yeah. success recent is success. Uh, waking up daily, fulfilling my dream. Mm -hmm. and being able to reach out to people like this here on the panel mm -hmm. where we can work together mm -hmm. and go locally yeah. because we don't know where our stuff is coming from if it's not local right. and we are better together. Mm -hmm. We've got more invested in ourselves. We have to, we have to work together because we look around at the chain of what's going on and there's parts and stuff you can't get for your vehicles and machinery, and it's all made in China. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't live in China. We're right here local. Mm -hmm. And if I can go over to Davis Farm and get 50 cattle or mm -hmm. 50 cases of chicken, mm -hmm. I have it right there locally at the market. The prices might be a little higher because I understand that he's not mm -hmm. getting a a check from anywhere else to sell it lower. He's got a decent and a great product. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want. And see, sometimes we spend money on the wrong stuff. And your body is a temple. Mm -hmm. And we've got to watch what we put in our temple. Mm -hmm. And so, hey, I pay a few dollars more. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can that's I riff good. off what he just said? Sure. Here? Sure. I, I wanted to add that your mushrooms, most of your mushrooms, 80% are grown in China. The ones that don't say grown in China are grown in international waters on ships. Mm. With recycled water, I don't know about that recycled water process. I used to work for a company and I understand how water is made mm -hmm. recyclable by removing proteins and sugars and things like that. And it's all addressed mainly chemically. So the things that you're getting from China that are really cheap and inexpensive that you don't think about are costing you a high price. Mm -hmm. One of them being mushrooms. The other one that's really common from China, almost all of it's grown in China, is garlic. Mm -hmm. And so you're getting a product that's shipped from thousands of miles away. It's losing its nutritional value as it's being shipped. It's affected climate change and the conditions under which these things are being grown are different than what the United States allows. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, the produce that you're buying is being grown off wastewater. That's I right. think we had this That's problem right. in California with the little oranges. Does anybody remember the recycled water with the little oranges? Well, you haven't seen anything until you've seen what they recycled in China. Mm -hmm. So it's not stuff you necessarily want to be growing, and it's contaminated with, with different things. Well, right now, there is a mushroom outbreak 
Don't worry, I'm not using any of those mushrooms, right? <laughs> but it's listeria. And I know where those mushrooms are grown. They're, they're, they're grown in, in China. When you hear about listeria, you normally think of it with a meat product. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what went into the mushroom that it has listeria? Meat, so because, yeah. eating yeah. locally is better for the planet, but it's also better for you. And it may cost you a little bit more up front, but it costs you less than doctor's bills. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I'm encouraging you to try and look a little bit more into your food sources. And sometimes they're avoiding saying being grown in China by putting it on a ship in international water. So look that up when you leave. But most of your mushrooms, like the ones you find in the grocery store, are not grown in the U.S. and haven't been grown in the U.S. in, in some times. And they also don't have any flavor. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's um, right. Another recent success... Uh, I've got a lot, a lot of recent success, but <laughs> one of them I would share, um, the Ujama Seed Cooperative. Uh, it is America's first black seed cooperative, and uh, I was able to join them and contribute my time and energy as well as seeds. I do grow seeds on my farm. Like Mia said, kale will grow if you starve it, That's feed right. it, do whatever. I'm a brassica. I focus on brassica, collard greens, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. turnip greens, mustard greens. Ooh. Yeah, those things that are simple um, mm -hmm. to grow mm -hmm. and are very nutritious. Just like there and put the collard greens that grow from my farm up in the gumbo. Yes, so they did. They're, yes, they're very oh, nutritious. So but yes, the uh, Ujama <laughs> Seed Cooperative. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find them online. We were written up in. Uh, Washington Post this summer. So wow, yes. what kind of things did you do uh, with them when you were? Well, when, it's when a you, collective, so there's so yeah. many people. It started as uh, culturally appropriate foods. Oh yeah. Right. So uh, the southeast mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. collards, mm -hmm. everything, mustards, uh, corn, and and now it's gone internationally. Um, we started with uh, our friends in Central and South America. Of course, our brothers and sisters in Africa. Mm -hmm. So we have a huge database, and we're moving forward quickly. Nice, nice. That's beautiful, right? It's such a, one thing I want to add to that, too, is like finding groups that you can um, get those ancestral seeds from is a really beautiful journey of growing um, because it doesn't always grow here in, in Portland. So if you can ga gather it from somewhere and experiment yeah. here, then you can build relationship with that plant, that mushroom, that animal um, in a yeah. really beautiful way. Absolutely. Um, collectively, um, we can do a lot. Like what happened here tonight is, is magical. It's beyond mm -hmm. magical. You're right. It really is. It's good to see all of you here too. And I think um, my question is, how much land do you need in order to grow something really uh, sustaining for a family of like three or four? That's real specific. Can, can I answer that question? Because yeah. I think I have to answer it in two parts. Okay. One is not very much land at all. So I spent some time teaching at the library um, some classes on small scale gardening, mm -hmm. just to feed your family. Mm -hmm. So most people don't have fruit trees anymore. Portland gentrified the fruit trees, by the way. When mm -hmm. I was in school and grew up here, you could walk down the street and pick up a plum, mm -hmm. pick up an apple, just food all over the place. I actually worked on the Portland uh, tree um, project, and I suggested that we have a food forest. They didn't take me up on that idea, and I don't think they'll be taking me up anytime soon on that idea. But the idea that you need a large space to grow some of the foods for your family is like totally erroneous. Mm -hmm. But that's what a lot of folks want you to think so you can keep going to the grocery store, mm -hmm. right? It, it works out for some people. But there are things you can grow, like I grew garlic along the fence lines. 
right? So they don't have to tear it up and just let it go back to seed, and it'll just propagate itself all over. Tomatoes grow really well here. Lettuce grows really well here. You can use raised beds. You can use um, hanging planters for like strawberries and tomatoes. I planted lettuce in bowls. I use cocoa bowls. So you can actually do it in a condo or most places, except except if you have a homeowner's association that tells you you can't. So there are, there are some restrictions against growing foods in certain places. So that's another problem with food justice is homeowners associations will often tell you what you can grow and where you can grow it. So in some places you can't grow fruit in your front lawn. But hanging baskets and planters, you can get the nice planters, grow pota potatoes on the bottom, corn and other things on, on the top. So actually you don't need any space? Yes. I'm in. <laughs> I'm going to run and plant something right now. I have a, a, a husband that has a, a green thumb. And uh, whatever he touches just grows and grows and grows. So uh, I tested him to see if he could bring um, the strawberries, get them to grow and be and be luscious and full-bodied and just ready. It was, it was really neat to watch him try to pull it together. But um, what I noticed, the traits that he had was that he was consistent, he was patient, he was pleasant around them, which is interesting because those of you who believe in talking to plants and things like that, there was just so much that, that he... Um, he has within his own personality, you know, that lends itself to having a green thumb. So I think everybody can have one, and we just have to kind of wrangle some of those attitudes that we have and put them in our back pocket and go out and try again. But um, tell me this. Here's a, a, a question for you. What has been your worst disappointment as it pertains to what you're doing? What was the... Really, the I think uh, for myself, mm -hmm. as being born and raised here in the long shot of north northeast Portland, mm -hmm. the people I grew up with not able to participate mm -hmm. because money wise mm -hmm. for product that they can't come and feed their family for a decent piece of meat. And that's really heartbreaking mm -hmm. to see. Like I said, I came up with nine, uh, 10 kids, 10 of, I'm number nine of 10. Mm -hmm. And we bought the whole cows and uh, we filled the freezer up, mm -hmm. you know, at one time. Yeah. And that's the way we raise it. And that's one of the disappointment because uh, we've got a lot of good places out here and people can't afford to feed four or five, six kids. So, you know, you gotta make choices. And that's been my biggest disappointment because mm -hmm. I can't feed the ones that really need a, a good piece of meat, a healthy piece of meat, and they can taste it different. And I'll tell anybody, go to Fred Meyers, go to Safeway, buy a pound of their hamburger. Mm -hmm. Here, I'll give you a half a pound of mine for free. Just cook it up and see the difference, mm -hmm. you know? So. Yeah, see what, what it tastes like. Because sometimes, sometimes it's, it's, all, it's not all about money but we need money to sustain, we, meet, we need land to sustain, and hard work pays off, and what we're doing, everybody here is working hard, mm -hmm. and we all got a common goal, mm -hmm. and we want things bigger and better, even everybody in the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, we've gotta look at ourselves and search our hearts and say, hey, what can I do better for me, for my family? Mm -hmm. And just look at it like that. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. No, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, also, the modeling that each of them have received from throughout the generations of, of being shown, you know, what is possible. You know, that doesn't happen when we keep separating ourselves, you know, when it's all your same age group that's hanging out with each other and nobody gets to talk across the generations. It doesn't, uh, we're not benefiting growth and, and uh, modeling and mentoring. And I think that's something that may have happened with my generation because we were really focused on um, trying to 
get a career, get ahead, and not, um, how do I want to put this? It's just I loved what you said when you were talking about how you perceived farming at first, you know, as, as kind of a slave thing, as, as being on the plantation and working hard. And that's that generational um, kind of fragility that happens. But we can learn new and we can learn a new way of looking at things. And I think if we can get enough people that can model that, then we all will be in a, in a better place, I think. Are you a nonprofit? Who's a nonprofit up here? Black Oregon Land Trust is a nonprofit. Okay, say that the, the name a little bit more. Just one more, just real strong. The Black Oregon Land Trust. Black is... Oregon Land Trust. Yes. And? No, I'm not. No, but I do have a mutual aid, mm -hmm. and the mutual aid organization just simply free, feeds people. So I was given some space at Salt and Light and began to glean and uh, just take things that I was growing. And I was feeding during the pandemic like 400 people a week, challenged some other chefs to feed people as well. And so just getting good food into people's hands, like you said, they can't afford it. That's right. mm -hmm. They can't afford the meat, they can't afford the vegetables. That's true. They're out here eating top ramen. How does anybody survive on eating top ramen? You know what's in there? Just the sodium content of mm -hmm. the top ramen is just astronomical, and it's not real food. So I have people dealing with health conditions who are least able to deal with health conditions. So yeah. I serve people on the street. I also ser serve the shelter on MLK and Union because they built a shelter with no showers and no kitchen. I don't know how that works, right? But so I guess giving people you a don't, roof, that's all you get. No, people no don't need to them. eat? I know. You know, it's just like, wow. So I was able to do that, and um, that, that is my uh, mutual aid. It's soon to be a nonprofit. And they put them out at a certain time of morning, though. Yeah, and they put them out at a certain time. That's what uh, they were talking yes. about. Yeah, yes. for sure. Um, no, not currently, but I'm working toward that. Um, how I met. Mia is um, what my nonprofit's mission is. Mm -hmm. We bring black, indigenous people of color, white people, anybody that wants to learn about agriculture out to our farm. And it started out as just a day with uh, livestock, a day with animals. And mm -hmm. from that, we've grown. Um, it's associated with a local festival in our community. Theron's been there, and he sells out every time. Imagine that. Um, called the Summit Fest. I live in Summit, Oregon. And um, yeah, so we have a Summit Agricultural Fest. Uh, Mr. Kaysen wasn't able to make it this year. Uh, Rachel wasn't. Theron made it. Mia made it. And it's a great event. We teach uh, the children, the families, about agriculture, um, specifically livestock, honeybees, how that works into uh, the system, and timber management, because we live in the middle of the forest. And one thing I will say, I, I have goats as well. I have less goats. Uh, a cougar has stalked and killed oh, two no. of my uh, goats. Oh, no. And um, last oh. year, Mia ate some of the goat that wasn't killed, uh -huh. and uh, we had it uh, Caribbean style from a chef, local. But yeah, so cougars are real that's apex right. predators. So that's just a small note of what I deal with mm -hmm. as a farmer, and I have children, so. Yeah, and they like children too. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Oh, you know, you know, I, my mind is racing, I'm sure yours is too, about um, how to get some of our middle schoolers and high schoolers out to the farm to really learn. You know, we have, I don't know, I call them the bougie gardens. You know, we've got those ones where you don't get to do very much and you don't get your hands dirty and you don't. I'd love to see... Uh, a way for there to be like an agricultural day where that's 
everything. Is there one? Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we, we do it. We can even step it up. I can allow anybody that wants to pound a T-post <laughs> or you know somebody that wants to pound a T-post. I, I, I need hundreds and you can pound hundreds, uh, even thousands of T-posts. What and are those a few for? hundred what are uh, rolls of fence. We can do it all. No, rolls of fence, yeah. yeah. You got to tell us what this is. It's like tea post. It's a place yeah. where you stand and drink tea. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> From above, when you're pounding, it when looks like pounding. a tea. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah, oh, so that's oh, okay. That, oh, that's interesting tea. that he mentions volunteers because mm -hmm. when I was at the farm, mm -hmm. they said, well, you're going to have to hire this amount of labor. And I did hire some labor to clear out some tansy because you have to pick it by hand. Uh -huh. Tansy is, is lethal to goats and, yep. and other animals. And it's this yellow flower, and it just crops up. And if it hasn't been taken care of, it spreads, and you have to get mm. rid of it. But the interesting thing is that a lot of people do actually want to be on the farm and learn this information. They just don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. So eventually, what I was told I couldn't do, there are pictures of people doing it all the way from New York and <laughs> other great? places. <laughs> the kids come out, and they... They can't get into any trouble. They can just run and have fun and, and learn lots of things. And you were going to say something before I so rudely cut you off there. Well, I was going to say, well, me and David was talking. And Oregon State has a big agriculture program down there. And we've, he's going to reach out and maybe get some resources so we can grow this thing out. Because, hey, we have a lot of gang problems out here. And the kids, we got to get these kids' mind mm -hmm. out of the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's get their minds on the good stuff. Hey, mm -hmm. you don't need a gun. You need a shovel. Mm -hmm. you, need to, you, need, you need to know what this, yes. Is, yeah. this yes. vegetable yes. is. And yes. we've got to turn things around. And there's too many kids sitting inside not learning. And a lot of them, they don't have a mother in the house or father in the house. And we wonder why stuff is happening, and that's part of the problem right there. So, I mean, I think this is the best thing can happen. Get them up and on the farm, and hey, like he does his barbecue every summer, maybe we'll uh, cut some beef up or do something, and they can see that. It, it's important. What, what Mr. Kaysen is saying, we've talked about a lot, but to break it down into bite-sized pieces, we are dissecting and educating the food system from literally the farm to the table. Mm -hmm. And yes. what he has is knowledge, mm -hmm. skills, and abilities, which equals wisdom, mm -hmm. right? So all of us have knowledge and some skills, and we need to be able to transfer that to the youth, this type of positivity exactly. um, mm -hmm. versus the negativity that they're surrounded. Mm -hmm. Your, your, I'm, I'm their really studies sure. have shown what happens to people when they go into nature. Yes. Oh, yes. It's, oh, yeah. It's a change. It's a living, it's a living, a living proof. Yeah. It's a change. It's a direct change. For me, being, I was an inner city kid that went into camps from the time I was like six years old. And it was being out in the wilderness. I was at Mount St. Helens, right? That shows you how long ago that was. But being there... I used to drag some of my friends from the neighborhood just to go to camp, and they were scared to death because Cougars we are had real. to hike into camp. We had to, pick, you know, they plant like kids. things. You had to eat. You had to... <laughs> I was a Pied Piper. I take them in. We're going to camp. They're like, "Oh my God, no!" <laughs> but once we came uh, into our own, while we were there, all the boundaries were just dropped, and everybody just kind of connected with one another in a way that lasted throughout our whole lives. When we see each other, I don't care if it's a counselor that you had or if it's somebody, you just are connected because you've had that experience. So um, being in nature to me, I have to be surrounded by trees now. I have to. I can't live somewhere where there are no trees because there's a peace that happens for me that I discovered from going and being out in the wilderness. And so you, if you have kids that are scared to go to camp or grandkids, just say, okay, but it's going to be fine and send them, you know, just send them. It's going to be okay. 
Um, I am looking at something. Um, how can we, would you come to an event if we had an event where everybody was celebrating agriculture? Would you come? Would you play? Would you actually do some of the stuff with us? Or would you just come and stand and watch us do it? Yeah, yeah. Would you bring a young person with you? See, that's, this is what I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's now how do we activate, right? Because they're already activating. And yeah, we just got to pick a date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here when? We just pick a date. Pick a date. And then we get all your information mm -hmm. and we send you an email. And we're like, <laughs> okay, you said you were going to come play with us. So what I'm going to do is I'll put um, a couple of pieces of paper out there for you guys to sign. And if it's something that you really feel that you would enjoy, number one. Number two, that you want to learn about uh, as far as agriculture is concerned and farming and what it all takes, you know, to make that happen. I mean, how many people are sitting around here watching uh, Yellowstone? Anybody watching Yellowstone? I watch Yellowstone. It's a guilty pleasure. But what happens when I watch is I start thinking about Texas and I start thinking about my family and start thinking about their hands being dirty and Getting, getting into the ground and doing what they need to do to make things happen for the family. So you, you just, you know, we can do that. We're going to put that sign back there. And you guys decide what you're going to do with it for everybody. But I, all I know is I'll, I'll go and sing, and then I'll plant something. <laughs> we, will, we will feed you. You will feed but, me? Yeah, we will work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we will work. You go no, work. No, there will be work. There will just, be some work. Just like my mama used to say at four o'clock in the morning, because she was from you know Texas and Louisiana. Now, it's like it's half the day's gone. That's right. You got to get up, get up, and go to work. Here's something uh, I want to find out from each person, if you know, or from anyone who knows. How much does it cost to maintain a farm per year? A lot. A lot. <laughs> I yeah. want you to get specific. A lot of Because energy, what I learned is when you start finding out the actual dollar amount, you don't know who is out here that can make things change. That's true. You know what I mean? So specific. Think, tell me this. In order to maintain your, the grounds that you have, your farm, how much does it cost? like property taxes and things like that? A million dollars. Easily? <laughs> no, I'm just is kidding. It, is that, no, but no. It, no, that's all no, right. Uh, no, uh, I would have believed you. <laughs> no, it's a, no, it's a, it, I don't have a, a, a dollar figure. I just mm -hmm. know it's a lot. I have 20 acres and uh, we have livestock. Mm -hmm. um, we buy hay local. We're getting into the point where uh, once we get equipment, mm -hmm. we can make our own hay. I have mm -hmm. enough pasture to do that. Great. Um, I grow a lot of the chicken feed mm -hmm. uh, myself. It's um, very rewarding, but very expensive. Mm -hmm. There's still investments I need to make, um, but I've been hacking at it for um, myself for six years until recently where I made these positive connections. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I really want to share my knowledge and I think uh, perhaps going, getting with Mr. Kaysen and other people mm -hmm. to get this nonprofit going where we can share our knowledge and make a big difference. But yeah, it's expensive. Have you worked with any of the community colleges or anything like that? Um, no, I just uh, made connections recently at Oregon State. Good. Um, I had been down there for a while, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't. I actually, I take that back. I did know someone at Oregon State, Dr. Thompson. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a tenured professor, the oldest egg customer uh, outside of my hamlet in Oregon. Um, Theron was a, one of my original egg customers. Uh, he was serving up food uh, on Killingsworth, um, doing a breakfast deal. 
yeah, I did know someone at Oregon State, and that's a, um, I wasn't making that connection. It was mm -hmm. uh, just a friendship and mm -hmm. a relationship. Mm -hmm. He's a very intelligent mm -hmm. man, and um, then I was made, uh, made to finally meet someone from the agriculture small farms recently. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's good. That's yep. good. I think it, more connections that you can make as far, and you know Correct. this, um, you never know if there's somebody who always just wanted to make sure that they could help a, uh, a business thrive, you know. Um, you never know. And I do a lot of charity work, and I, I see people that you just would never imagine that they would even be interested. Yeah. But they come, they come and they supply what they can, but then they tell their friends about it. And I, I just, my mind is always out here. I see this big farm to table down the middle of MLK. You know, just everybody's eating and enjoying and it's a festival and then we all put them in buses and take them out to the farm and then they gotta work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all up and down MLK. Uh, mm. Also, I wanna shout out Jerusalem Rose Market. They were the first Portland uh, store to get mm -hmm. to buy uh, poultry and eggs mm -hmm. from me, as well as produce. So I really want to shout them out. And uh, Sonia Mitchell, yeah. Beetroot uh, is closed now, but number one first supporter. A lot of there's been a lot of good people who support me along the way. So everybody out here in this audience, what's one thing that you want them to remember and take away from today? Um, and I'll go down to each Yeah, person, so. strength, strength and unity, mm -hmm. I, and I'll, I digress. Strength and unity. Mm -hmm. This is tough. Um, I'm going to say the best thing you can do is try and eat local. Mm -hmm. You live here. You want your farmers and folks to survive here, and you want to have food security. So I'm going to say eat local for reasons of climate change and try and find out um, who your farmers of color are, immigrants, and try and, and patronize them as well. Love and understanding. We all love somebody. We give love, we receive love. We gotta love ourselves before we can love and do for anybody. Mm -hmm. And we gotta do it healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's a long race, it's not a, it's not a fast race, mm -hmm. and it's not a fast pace. So that's what I say. Yeah, yeah, it's always beautiful. Yeah, the marathon continues. <laughs> that's yes, right. And I would, yes, ever since I've lived here in Portland, I could definitely say that um, I felt that community here, mm -hmm. you know, like from something that I thought would be like small news in New Orleans, it was here, they were like, no, we're, we're, more, we're coming together, and I can really, I feel that, and the whole local thing, it's, um, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just want to, yeah, that's all I can say. I want to be part of it, huh? Yeah, I yeah. just stay part of it. I'm going to be yeah. part of it. Yeah. You are I'm a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. And his family, yeah. yeah. They, they've also come down to the Agriculture Fest, our local community festival. Um, yeah, it's a family, family event. When is that? What months are that? Those uh, like August. Yeah. August? Like the first week, second week? What? Can, you'll never forget this. Third weekend in August, annually. Oh. That's it. We all are going to go, right? Is that true? Go ahead. Give us our last thing. What do you want to take away? For them to so take away? I want everybody to close your eyes for a second and pull out of your mind, like, into your eyelids or whatever. Pull forward that dream, that vision that you've been sitting on, that you weren't really sure, that you believed in. And I want you to start to bring it into your reality and trust that it can happen. And it doesn't have to be as hard as you think it is or as hard as it's been. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. And I hope everyone rests well tonight mm -hmm. and ponder, like percolate on that dream and that vision 
And like really you can, I'm, I feel like my life is the proof that that, that is possible. Mm -hmm. I sat at, just for two years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with like, I need to live on land. I have a child, I need this future and worked collectively with other people, shared that vision. I was like, this is crazy, but did you know I want to do this? Um, and, and know that like we are a part of that, you know, like reach out to us. Don't forget that we're a part of your vision come into reality and you're a part of ours. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. That's a beautiful way to wrap this up. I, I am very um, thankful for all of you. I'm grateful that you've took, taken time out of your lives to be here. And uh, you've taken uh, away the fear factor of gathering. And we're sitting together. And I think we, because we're thinking about something that is unifying and beautiful, that we will be protected and we'll be able to do this again. Thankful for the old church and for this beautiful space that always brings spirit to resonate. And i um, thankful for Amanda. Amanda's done a lot of hard work pull, helping to pull this together. And she's just always so, so organized and, and just always there, you know, a voice of, of reason. I'd like to thank our uh, cameraman, who is also a phenomenal documentarian and director, uh, John Meyer. It's great. <laughs> and the team at the old church. And so I leave you with this. May you always find the spirit to be who you need to be. May you always find the love to reach another on their way. There are times when you wish for something, it already has come true. So just run towards your passion. Run toward your passion. And you and I will see it all. Come true. Oh. Have a great Christmas season. All right, all right. Thank you for coming.